Um, people have asked me about that. But I want to show you something on the worksheet. We're going to talk first of all about the end times events, um, signs of the times. Uh, if you noticed on there, we talked about several things there. First of all, uh, notice our first slide, if you will, economic Armageddon. And no, most of you know that the oil prices went through the floor last week. We actually had negative oil futures uh, for May contracts. That means that they were actually paying people to take oil. Now, that's a significant economic situation and an issue. A lot of people think that that's going to cause some great catastrophic problems across the world because there are a number of countries that actually derive their revenue off of the oil that they sell. So be in prayer about that. That's going to be uh, coming in the next few months. Pestilence. We got the COVID-19 still ongoing. Many of you are hunkered down at home today because of the COVID-19. We also talked about the locust plague. Uh, earthquake. There was an earthquake in Papua New Guinea, 6.3. I think it was actually this morning. This is Saturday, by the way. Uh, falling away. I, I read this article about the female lesbian Episcopalian priest, Catherine Ragsdale, becomes the CEO of the National Abortion Federation. So uh, there will be a great falling away. Talk about falling away from the truth. My goodness. Um, then we have Israel persecution. Thing, things are going to be happening in the end times. Israel is going to be persecuted. Saints of God are going to be persecuted. Uh, we see the Lutherans have published a new Bible version that omits the word Israel. So that's an interesting statement there, an interesting article I read. Big Brother, Apple and Google joining forces. Many of you have read about this or heard about it on the news. Joining forces to track people's movements in order to contain the epidemic. So now when you, get a, when you get close to somebody, your phone has the ability to tell you that you may be infected. Now, uh, that is a deep concern because if you realize and understand in the end times uh, that the Antichrist is going to use some of these great technologies that are being invented uh, to exercise his authority and to persecute those that are saved, you will not be able to buy and sell in the end times because the Antichrist will not allow such. Um, anyway, that's talking about the tribulation. We'll talk about that actually next week. In Daniel chapter 12, we're going to start talking about the tribulation. So it's an interesting study. Uh, what else? Uh, this is an interesting article I read this week. The temple and building, the Sanhedrin in Israel, gets authorization to use their trees and vineyard fruit for the third temple. Now, if you know, in, in Leviticus chapter 19, it talks about uh, when they get into the land, they'll be able to uh, grow fruit, but they weren't able to use that fruit for five years. Uh, the first three years, it was considered an abomination. The fourth year, it was dedicated to the Lord. But on the fifth year, they could begin using that fruit. Well, five years ago, the Sanhedrin began planting trees and vineyards to be able to use the trees and the olive oil and the, olive, uh, and the fruit or the, uh, the, grape fruit, or the grapes in the uh, temple worship. So that's an interesting uh, article. End times are coming. All right, if you have your Bible, Daniel chapter 11. We'll begin reading in verse 36. Now, most scholars believe that there's a transition between Daniel uh, uh, 1135 and Daniel 1136 because we go from a known king, which we talked about, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, to an unknown king, a king of the future. So look at verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done all right so as we start right there we'll go through a few slides and review uh, if you've been in this class any length of time you know that i do a lot of review because repetition is the key to learning we go back, we learn a little bit, then we go back and relearn what we learned, then we go back and relearn what we learned, then we go back and relearn what, and as we learn, as we continue to do that, you'll remember more that way. I don't spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to spend just a moment or two. So we've got Daniel chapter 1, is all about Daniel purposing in his heart. He was taken captive into Babylon uh, with the first wave. He was of the seed royal. He became a servant and a slave to the uh, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. In Nebuchadnezzar, uh, chapter 2, we saw, we saw 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the metal man, the man with the head of gold, the arms of silver, and we talked a great deal about that. Daniel chapter 3 was all about the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, and then the fiery furnace where the three Hebrew children were, were thrown in there, and then the Son of God walking with them in the fiery furnace. Then in Daniel chapter 4 was all about the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. God got a hold of his heart, and he wrote that chapter in the book of, the, in the book of Daniel uh, as, a tribute, as a tribute to how God got a hold of his heart, and he said in the end that God is able uh, to humble the proud. So then Daniel chapter 5 was all about Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, the handwriting on the wall, and the fall of Babylon. Daniel chapter 6 was about Daniel and the den of lions. Now my wife said that I said last week, lion's den, and you know that's one of my pet peeves. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's Daniel and the den of lions. All right, uh, Daniel chapter 7 marks a transition. 1 through 6 is all about history, the history of Daniel. 7 through 12 is all about the prophecies of Daniel. Though this is where it gets all complicated and convoluted and where people get confused and they don't understand. And so we're going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, getting an understanding of these great prophecies. Daniel chapter 7 is all about the four beasts, the throne, and the little horn. Uh, we started Daniel chapter 7 during the uh, pandemic. So you'll, real, you'll be able to go back and actually look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. We have all of those lessons up on Facebook. Daniel chapter 8 was about the ram, the goat, and the enigma. Daniel chapter 9 is about powerful prayer and the 70 weeks. Daniel chapter 10 was all about spiritual warfare. And then Daniel chapter 11, the first part of Daniel chapter 11, we call it the north and the south. It's all about Daniel's final vision. Daniel's 10, 8, uh, 10, 11, and 12 are all the same vision. Chapter 10 was about the spiritual warfare that led up to him receiving the vision. Daniel chapter 11, the first part, is all about the war between the north and the south. And you saw this slide with uh, the uh, from Nebuchadnezzar to Alexander. We saw um, Nebuchadnezzar, then Cyrus the Great is the king that is mentioned. In Daniel, uh, he was the king that allowed the children of Israel to go back. And then we go through all of these kings all the way until Alexander the Great. And then we have, after Alexander, his kingdom was divided into multiple kingdoms, but two main kingdoms, the Seleucid kingdom in the north and the Ptolemaic kingdom in the south. And these two are all, uh, this is exactly what the first part of Daniel chapter 11 is about. It's about these key, two kings uh, fussing and feuding uh, amongst themselves. We showed you this slide of all the kings of the north and all the kings of the south. Some of the names that you might remember are Ptolemy. Ptolemy was the uh, uh, the first one, the first Ptolemy, and then a bunch of them were named Ptolemy. You might remember the name Cleopatra. There are actually seven of them. Uh, the last one is the most famous one. She was the one that was in power when the Romans came and took control of Egypt, so she was an, she was not an Egyptian. She was a Greek, Cleopatra. So, and then the kings in the north, we read about several of these. We also read about Antiochus the Great, who is uh, one of the kings mentioned in Daniel chapter eleven, and then also his son, which was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus the Fourth. He was the one that persecuted the Jews. And if you rem remember the study, we talked about how there was this great revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, which is, a, uh, the book of Maccabees in the Apocrypha often talks about the, uh, people talk about that's, that's the history of it. But I don't encourage you to read the Apocrypha because it's not historically correct and it's certainly not theologically correct. Uh, but there is historical data that supports some of the things that occurred during the time of the Maccabees. The Maccabees were a, um, it, it, was, it was the uh, outcome of this persecution that was started by Antiochus Epiphanes. So then we stop right there, and then there's a whole bunch of other kings that are mentioned. They're not mentioned in the scripture, but they're mentioned in history. And then we go from verse 35, Antio Antiochus Epiphanes, to a brand new king. This new king that comes on the scene is speaking of the end times king that will come, the Antichrist. This is some information about Antiochus Epiphanes. And then we had some lessons from Daniel chapter 11, the verse 
uh, uh, the first few verses, and these were the lessons. In a world of chaos, we find stability in Christ. That which appears to be out of control is all part of God's plan. Amen and amen. The times of persecution and trial reveal your true faith and character. So we're, there's times of persecution. There's times of chaos. This young, uh, this uh, small nation that was in the middle of these two kings that were battling back and forth all the time. This feud going on. They were being tossed around. They were being persecuted. They were being uh, uh, going through trial and tribulation. And yet we talked about how you can find strength in Christ. So, all right, now, our next slide, here we go. Antichrist shall come. So the transition is in verse 36. We see the difference because this guy exalts himself and magnifies himself above every god. We know this is not the same king because Antiochus Epiphanes exalted the god Zeus. Uh, he's, he's the one who put the idol of Zeus in the temple and created what was the one of the first uh, abominations of desolation. There's been several of them through the scripture. There was one at, at this time. Uh, there was perhaps another one in 70 AD when the last temple was destroyed. And there will be another one in a new temple that will be built on the temple mount. And there will be another abomination of desolation that will be placed by this guy, the Antichrist that shall come. All right, so let's look at verse 37. Uh, we, we've read verse 36. He'll exalt himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things. Where have we heard that before? Uh, let's take one little look and see what we've learned so far about the, uh, the uh, Antichrist from the other uh, uh, chapters or from the other visions. So if you look at uh, this slide, it tells you the things we learned in 7, 8, 9, and 10 about the Antichrist. The first time we, he's mentioned, Daniel chapter 7, he's the little horn. He's the one that comes with the blasphemous words. He's the one who made war with the saints. You remember we talked about who are the saints there. It's not just talking about Israel. It's talking about everyone who wears the jersey. Remember I put the jersey on and I wore the jersey and I showed you there made war with the saints and then he he thought to change times and, and laws and then we have this in this interesting time frame this three and a half years time times and a half times or three and a half years we'll see that several times through the scripture Daniel chapter 8 he's the little horn enigma we call him the enigma because he understood the dark sentences the riddles this guy's going to be smart he's going to be wise and we're going to understand why he's so smart and so wise is because he's going to be uh, empowered by the dragon we'll see in revelation chapter 13 he's going to be empowered by the devil himself so this antichrist is a person who is empowered by the devil we're going to see he waxed great he magnified himself um, we, first, we first see the abomination of desolation in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 9, he is the traitor king. He's the king that makes the seven-year treaty with the people of God, and then he violates that treaty halfway through, again, with the three and a half years, he, by placing the abomination of desolation. In Daniel chapter 10, he is mentioned as the prince of the king, uh, uh, the prince of the king of Persia, the prince of Persia, and he was the one that was resisting righteousness. He resisted the uh, the uh, um, the uh, angel of the Lord that was coming to help Daniel in his prayer time. And then he was the one in, that was instrumental in promoting evil in the Persian kingdom. And we see that that continues on even into the Grecian kingdom and probably into uh, all kingdoms. The, the devil has his imps and his uh, powers that be uh, enforcing his uh, will on these kings. Okay, so let's look at this king. First of all, in verse 36, he, uh, he is the king that does according to his will. Now, what that means is that he is unchecked. There is no restraining power on him. Our, our president has some authority, but he, ha he doesn't have absolute authority. He doesn't have all power like this guy is going to have all power to do according to his will. There's no government um, checks and balances. There's no Senate. There's no, uh, there, there, there's no uh, uh, House of Representatives that can, uh, that can challenge him. They'll, he'll have some challenges from other nations. But in this case, he actually has all authority and all power. And by the way, that is uh, because he is given that power. People actually want him to have that power, and they give him that authority. We'll see that a little bit later. 
Verse, uh, continue on, verse 36. It shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god. Uh, he doesn't just ex exalt himself above the God of, uh, uh, of Jehovah, although that is his, uh, his uh, um, he, he is aggressively attacking Jehovah, but he exalts himself above every God, all religions out there. What else does he do? And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. God allows this guy to be in control until the very end. He will not uh, lose control or lose power, though people will come against him, though people will try to, uh, to uh, 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 overthrow him. He'll be killed at one point, but he'll come back to life. And so this guy, actually, he'll be shot in the head, and we'll see that in, in uh, Revelation. Uh, but he, he, God has determined that this guy is going to remain in power until the end of the indignation. The end of the indignation is when God is done, not when the Antichrist is done. By the way, God is still in control, even though he's allowed this guy to be in control. Okay. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Verse 37. He will not have any regard for the God of his fathers. In other words, he has no respect for the God of his fathers. He has no respect for religion at all. He has no respect for the family. He has no respect for the family role model. It says he'll have no desire for women, uh, which most people believe that means that he'll be a homosexual and he'll be a promoter of that kind of lifestyle. We'll see that a little bit later as well. No regard and nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now, this is an interesting study. Uh, we'll come back to that, but I want you to think about that word, forces. A lot of people think that means the God of armies. It has nothing to do with armies. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. It actually has more to do with social justice than it does about armies. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So he's going to have some enemies. But even the devil can't control his enemies. Uh, they're going to come against him. People are not going to be, no, want to be under his power. The king of the south is going to come and fight him. The king of the north is going to come and fight him. And they are going to be destroyed, it says, with an overflowing. Look at the bottom, bottom of verse 40. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he, that's the king, uh, the Antichrist, shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. In other words, he's not going to be defeated. God has already determined this guy is going to remain in power. Okay? All right, verse uh, next, verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land. When it talks about the glorious land or the pleasant land, it's talking about the land of Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, those are three uh, groups of people that represent, uh, represented in certain areas of the land around Israel. Some people believe that these are going to be uh, Muslim nations that are going to, that are going to be um, exempted from his totalitarian rule and control. Uh, for some reason, these three groups of people are escaped. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, what does that mean? We'll talk about that in just a minute. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. That's talking about Israel. It's actually talking about the Temple Mount. Uh, yet he shall come to his end. Amen and amen. And none shall help him. So let's jump to the end. Okay, right here we go. We will win. Praise the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. We can shut the book and go home right there and just shout. But let's learn some things. Okay, here we go. 
Daniel chapter 11. We're almost through the book of Daniel, and I hope you're getting some of this. This is interesting stuff. Okay, here we go. Here's our slide. He'll have unbridled authority, absolute power. He exalts himself above every god. He's particularly aggressive against Jehovah. For some reason, he has this vendetta, this hatred against the people of God, not only the Jews, but also the Christians, and we'll see that. He has no regard for the institution of the family, no regard for the desire of women. He honors the God of forces, which is the God of safe spaces. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He shall divide the land for gain. He's going to take control of the land, uh, a lot of the land, probably worldwide, and then he's going to divide it amongst those that he honors or those that honor him, the, the, those that worship him, and he's going to divide it unto them. He's going to give it away, and he's going to not going to give it away to them. He's going to give it away to, for gain. In other words, he's going to tax them for it. So, um, But he's going to put down rebellious uh, from the south and the north. He focuses on the Holy Land. He's going to enter into the Holy Land, and a select few will remain elusive. Several countries are not going to be under his totalitarian control. Uh, he gains control of the world money supply and the continent of Africa. He continues his conquest ruthlessly, and he shall plant a palace in the Holy Land. That's all there in verse 36 through 45. So who is this guy? Go ahead and look, if you will, uh, in Revelation chapter 13. Take your Bible there. I've got the verses printed out here, but it might not be a bad idea for you to look at it in your own Bible. And I want you to mark this because this is the introduction to the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. I didn't want to give you a whole lot of references to Revelation because we're going to Revelation eventually and we're going to reference back to what we learned in Daniel. But since this is the last reference of the Antichrist in the book of Daniel, I wanted to give you the references to the Antichrist and what he's really going to be like as described in the book of Revelation, in John's Revelation. John and Daniel are two different guys. Daniel saw things a little differently. Uh, John saw things a little differently. But this guy is described in detail in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power, and his seat and great authority. So who gave him the power? It was the dragon. The dragon is the devil. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded unto death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now remember when we saw those four beasts mentioned in Daniel? We saw the lion, we saw the bear, we saw the uh, leopard, uh, and we saw the <coughs> mouth of a man. The head of a man, all that was mentioned in the book of Daniel. I mean, uh, 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 the leopard, the lion, the bear, and the, and the other beast. That, that, that was the, the, the nondescript beast in Daniel chapter uh, 7. Okay, and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded unto death, but his deadly wound is healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Next verse. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Now, that's interesting. They didn't just worship the beast. The beast was the, the Antichrist. They worshiped the dragon that gave him the power. Now we're going to see, <coughs> we see in this chapter, that he introduces a new god to the world. He says, ah, forget about all those other gods, Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, all these other uh, gods, uh, and Krishna, all the other goofball gods. I've got the right God. I've got a good God. I've got a better God. Matter of fact, I'm that God. Y'all just worship me. And he wor they worship the, the beast, the Antichrist, but they also worship the dragon that gave him the power. So he introduces that God. He introduces himself as God. They worship him. In the process of worshiping him, they're worshiping the dragon, the devil. And there was given unto him a mouth. Next slide. Uh, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Now remember in Daniel, we saw three and a half years, 3.5 years, time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. Guess how long 42 months is? That's three and a half years. 
That's interesting. That's that's, an, that's that's a time that's a time stamp. You need to mark that down as a time stamp. Okay, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies. Who was it that was blaspheming God and speaking great and mighty things against God? Well, it's the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. Same guy. Against God, blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ear, let him hear. Now, in Daniel chapter 12... We're going to talk about people whose names are in the book of life. And this is going to be, you don't want to miss that lesson. Matter of fact, that's probably going to be a better lesson. So you tune in next week, Daniel chapter 12, the book of life. You're not going to want to miss that. All right, here's our Antichrist. He's the man of sin. He exalts himself above God. He has he, he uh, uh, causes war on all religions. Uh, we, we read in Daniel chapter 7 that he... Um, that he makes war with the saints. He desecrates the temple, uh, places the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is an idol that is placed in the holy place that causes it to become desolate or filthy. You've heard the term, well, that I wouldn't go in there. That place is filthy. And that's what happens with the people of God. They, they realize that an idol has been placed in their holy temple, and they say, oh, man, we can't go in there. It is filthy. It is an abomination. It is, a, it is desolate. Okay, and he casts truth to the ground. In other words, uh, truth is trampled. Truth is cast to the ground. It's no longer, you don't need a Bible. Uh, and it's not just the Bible. He'll attack all truth, okay? Because the Bible talks about he makes craft uh, to prosper. And the word craft there means fraud. So he's going to cause fraud to prosper in the land. That's Daniel chapter 7. All right. He has no regard for the institution of the traditional family, no regard for women or the desire of women. He is an enemy of all God's institutions, including the family. You're going to see as we get closer and closer to the end times that the traditional family role model is going to be uh, attacked even more vehemently than it is today. Uh, the homosexual crowd, he will be a proponent, a proponent of and a champion of the anti-God anti-bible lifestyles including homosexuality a lot of people think he'll be a homosexual at the time uh this guy okay uh, uh he honors the god of forces now i told you we talked about this the word forces means place or means of safety protection refuge or stronghold he's not going to be a uh, king of armies as a matter of fact he has actually given an army in daniel chapter 7 uh, where it talks about he, he uh, uh, causes the daily sacrifices to cease, and then he is given an army to be able to enforce that law. So he's not going to be the god of, uh, or the king of armies. He's going to be the king of safe spaces. He's going to be the king of social, social justice. What does that mean? Well, a safe space refers to the place, to places created for individuals who feel marginalized. Uh, and come together to communicate regarding their experiences. You've heard about this on college campuses and some uh, uh, workplaces now have places where you can come and you don't have to listen to anybody who talks bad about your fill in the blank. My, I'm just, I feel bad. I don't, I don't want somebody telling me that, that my lifestyle is wrong, you know. Um, it, it's, it, and they can get in there and they can sit around with other people of like mind and talk about how marginalized they are and how oppressed they are and how hurt they are and how their feelings are hurt and how sinful and wicked and ungodly they are, except they won't use those terms. See, that's the problem. They don't want anybody to talk about sin or ungodliness or unrighteousness uh, they just want to feel good about themselves. That's why you have today, um, you know, stores that will now allow transgender men to go into the ladies' bathrooms. You have lawsuits in place where they have uh, male tra transgender teachers who want permission to go into the little girls' bathrooms. That is a shame and a disgrace in our country, and they're learning that in the safe spaces. Don't talk to me about your opposition to my lifestyle. Don't talk to me about your opposition uh, to uh, common sense uh, politics. 
Uh, we just want to feel good, and we don't want people making us feel bad. And so they're getting rid of all the conservatives off of campuses, uh, campuses now. They're getting rid of all uh, uh, Bible classes, Bible students, people who teach and preach truth. And that will continue. And it's not going to get any better, unfortunately. It's very sad. But this guy is going to, is be, will be a champion of that ideology. He'll also be a champion of social justice and the marginalized. He will, make, he will build his army out of the marginalized, marginalized people of the world. So keep that in mind. He will honor the God of forces, the strongholds, the protected places. The, the, uh, and he'll use that as a, uh, as a means of persecuting Christians. Well, you can't preach that because it hurts people's feelings. You can't have a Bible because it talks about uh, sodomy and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of sodomy. You can't preach that anymore. You can't teach that anymore. It hurts people's feelings. He'll be the God of that. He'll be the king of that. And he'll be the champion of that. Here's the guy. He is the Antichrist. What else? He gains control of the world money supply and the economic system. This is an interesting statement. Look at verse number 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all precious things of Egypt. Now, what does that mean? Well, we understand what gold and silver is. That has to do with the monetary supply. Okay, there, we know that in the end times, he's going to make it illegal to buy and sell unless you have the mark of, his, of the beast, the 666 plastered in your forehead or in your arm. If you don't have that, you can't buy and sell. How is he going to do that? In order for him to be able to do that, he's going to have to have control of the monetary supply of the world. Well, how can that happen? You know, it wasn't until just recently, within the last probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, where that could even be possible. Because now we have almost all money is digital money anyway. Most people use credit cards. They use their phone. They boop it on the scanner and the money is taken out of your account and put into the bank account of someone else or taken out of their bank account and put into your bank account. Very few people actually deal in spe you know, specie or actual money these days. So there, they'll may, there may come a time when there's no such thing as actual paper money. Okay, Keep that in mind as, you st as we study through this because it's going further and further that way. There was a, t a time in America where every bank for every loan that they made, they had to have at least 10% of the actual physical money in the bank for, for uh, the loans that they made. Now it's a fraction of that. They don't even have to have the money, and most of them don't. You go down to your bank today or uh, on Monday and try to uh, take out every dime of money you have in the bank, a lot of times you can't get that if it's over a couple thousand dollars because they don't actually have it in the bank. They don't have to order it from somewhere to get that kind of cash. Uh, because most people work on a digital currency system. Uh, even I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about actual digital money. Uh, where do you think the $6.6 .6 trillion came from? They didn't just, uh, they, they didn't print that money up. They, they just put it in the, the ledger in the computer and said, bam, it's there. And it just magically appeared. Where do you think this 486 billion or 436 billion that's coming for more, uh, you know, pay paycheck protections? Where do you think it's coming from? It, they didn't go in down to the bank and went make a withdrawal. There's no money there. It doesn't exist. They just spoke it into existence. That's why this oil crisis could be a big deal because a lot of these countries don't have the luxury that America has to speak money into existence. They actually have to have uh, something that backs it, and in most cases. In some cases, it's actually the oil of their country that backs their economy. So the price of oil is going down. There could be some great, bad, bad things happen. Some really, really bad things happen. Okay, he is uh, he all uh, he had the treasures of gold and silver represents the tangible money markets. Now look at the next part. All precious things of Egypt. I did a study on this, and there's a chapter in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 19, that talks about Egypt. And the destruction of Egypt, where this great king is going to come and destroy Egypt. And in it, it talks about Egypt being the center of certain uh, world uh, uh, commodities, such as uh, producers of food, oil, paper products, water, 
if, if you wanted water in your area, um, it was controlled by Egypt. A clothing, a lot of the clothing that was made in the world in those days was made in Egypt. Medicine, a lot of the apothecaries, a lot of the uh, uh, medicines that came around the world in those days literally came from Egypt. So when it talks about that they'll have, he'll have control of all the precious things of Egypt, I believe it's talking about the world's commodities. He's going to have control of the world's oil. He's going to have control of the world's paper products, water, uh, possibly coat, clothing, and medicine. He could have control of all of those things in the end. All right, and then he'll be the epitome of a modern consumption society. Uh, Antichrist will control everything that is available on the market. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, next. He shall plant his tabernacle in the glorious mountain, the land of Israel, the temple mount. Uh, it's personal with him. Why? Why does he want to go to Israel? There's a lot prettier places in the world than Israel. Israel is a, a, a beautiful place, but it's a, it's, a, it's a barren landscape compared to some places in the world. Why would he care to live there? Well, because this is the Antichrist. He's backed by the devil, and the devil hates God, and he hates God's people, and it's personal with him. He wants to plant his kingdom right there on the Temple Mount where God said he would sit and rule the world, all right? Uh, he, his hatred and perverseness is ultimately revealed, uh, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. There will be no one who can stop his utter destruction. So he'll come to his end uh, and no one will care about him. All those people that worshiped him, won't, it won't matter then. The, of course, by that time, the, the judgment of God will have come down and people will have opened their eyes, I think. Okay, what to expect in the coming days? This is what everybody wants to know. Brother Steve, what can I do? What can I expect? What is going to happen? I'm glad you asked. Here we go. You ready? What to expect? Number one, economic convulsions and chaos. This is what's going to happen in the end time. Now, is it going to happen during this pandemic? It sounds like people are trying to get back to normal. People are starting to go back to work. Um, when I go out on the road, I have to work because I'm considered an essential employee uh, with insurance. They, they consider that essential. So I'm still doing what I've always done. And uh, I've noticed that when I get out on the road, there's still a lot of people out there. There's people going to and fro. There's people doing things. And so we're getting back to normal. Will all of this stimulus help? I don't know. I know there's going to be some economic turmoil, some ups and downs, and it always happens that way. Uh, but there, there may be some severe convulsions. You may lose your 401k. You may lose your job. You may lose your business. You may have some difficulty, okay? Understand that. Realize these things could happen in the coming days. What's next? Distress of nations. World government sentiment. In other words, there's going to be some people out there saying, you know what? We don't ever want to go through this again. We need a one world government to handle all of this. And that's going to come. There, someday, somehow, some way, they're going to have a one world government. And they're going to have a, uh, the king of the world. Antichrist is going to be that guy. So uh, eventually it's coming. Uh, growing anti, oh, uh, increase in natural disasters, pestilence, and famine. We talked about the famine that is uh, predicted in uh, Africa because of the locusts um, that are coming. The locusts are there. The locusts are destroying everything. They eat everything. There won't be anything green for hundreds and hundreds of square, maybe thousands of square miles, maybe millions of square miles. Uh, it's happened before, it's happening again in the worst, worst way. There'll be a great famine in Africa in the coming days. Growing anti-God sentiment, that's coming. There'll be great persecution. Yea, they, yea, uh, they that shall live godly shall suffer persecution. The Antichrist and his imp will make war with the saints and the people of God. The persecution is coming. Perilous times shall come. The Bible says it's coming. You can't get away from it. You can't live life and, and, and live for God and not expect some type of persecution. It's going to come. Uh, the rise of global technologies and false sciences. Uh, growing apostasy of churches. We're seeing that increasing every day. Uh, every, every year we're seeing more and more churches that are uh, uh, embracing the homosexuals and embracing anti-God Bibles and embracing uh, theology that is totally against Scripture. 
And they're doing it in the name of God. So increasing apostasy, growing apostasy, increase attacks on truth and righteousness. Uh, you already can't use your Bible in schools. You already can't pray in schools. Eventually they'll, uh, they'll the, and it's going to get worse, unfortunately. Okay, signs in the sun, moon, and stars. We haven't talked about that, but that'll be coming. All right, what else? What should I do? Brother Steve, it's all bad. It's going to get worse. And you just keep saying it's going to get worse. It's already bad. Well, I got some good news for you. Amen. Uh, I try to leave you with an encouragement. I try to leave you with uh, something that says, hey, you know what? It, it may be bad, but God has a plan. God has a way. And so let's look at a couple of encouraging things. I want to leave you with this. I'm encouraged because we had nearly 60 people um, log into our Sunday school class last week. So I'm thankful for that. I don't know if they watched it all the way through, but they watched a part of it. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And you're here this morning and you're getting it. You're reading your Bible and you're studying, you're walking with God. You're understanding the joy of the Lord. So how in the world can I be encouraged and not cry myself to sleep every night during this pandemic? All right, here we go. Number one, understand God's plan. Understand God's plan. God has a plan for you and for me. God has a plan in these times. Uh, God's not sitting up in heaven scratching his head saying, man, what is happening down there? It's all falling apart. I don't know what's going on. No, God knows exactly what's going on. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what, how you'll feed your family next week. He knows where your next paycheck's coming from. He knows how you're going to make your mortgage payment. He knows everything. And he has a plan. And God commands us to understand the signs of the times. He said in Matthew chapter 24, be not deceived. It's our responsibility to be not deceived. Well, how do we do that? Well, you got to understand what God's doing. And understanding these prophecies is the first step in understanding what God is doing and how he's going to do it in the coming days. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen. I know it bothered Daniel something bad, awful. We're going to see in Daniel chapter 12 where he, he finally says, God, I need to understand this. And God says to him, hey, shut up the book. Seal the book. It's done. Stop fretting over it. Stop worrying about it. Stop talking about it. Stop uh, being all. He, and then in the end, he says, go thy way, Daniel. Go thy way. Stop asking me for more information. I'm not giving you any more. You've got the book. Now go do what I told you to do. And that's what God's telling us. Understand, God has a plan. I don't know all the answers, and we're not going to know all the answers. Some of this is for the end times, the very end times, when we don't even know what's going to happen then. But we can understand what's happening now, and we can keep trusting God. Number one, understand God's plan. Number two, search for opportunities. Search for opportunities. This is an opportunity for, to win people to Christ, it's an opportunity to reach people that are concerned. It's an opportunity to reach people who are going to be at rock bottom during these days. It's going to be sad. It's going to be sad. There's going to be a lot of people. 20-something uh, million people have lost their jobs, filed for unemployment. Uh, there's going to be people who are going to need help. Search for opportunities. There's going to be opportunities for you to reach people. There's going to be opportunities for you to help people. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, there's also going to be opportunities for you to capitalize on, uh, on the economic situation. Stocks have gone down. The price of oil has gone down. Um, there, if you have some money and you can invest in, in things right now that are going down that are eventually going to go back up, might not be a bad idea to research that and learn that. Okay? Uh, save your money. Don't go into debt. Uh, be a, pay attention to what's going on in the, times, uh, in the times ahead. All right, number three, here we go. Be strong for others. If you're weak and you're falling apart, people can't get help and strength from you because you're the one who needs help and strength, okay? Get, be strong. Uh, God told Daniel twice in the preceding chapter, be strong, be strong. Be strong, be strong. He told him, be strong. Stand up and be strong and be a help and be a blessing to others. All right, we'll close the lesson with that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Go ahead and like and share uh, with everybody on Facebook so more people will be uh, <clears throat> will, uh, will uh, tune in. We want to get the truth out. We don't do it for likes and shares, obviously. Uh, we're just doing it to help people. And then next week, here we go. Next week, Daniel chapter 12, the final prophecy. You're not going to want to miss it. If you've been here from Daniel chapter 1 
to Daniel chapter 11, you're not going to want to miss Daniel chapter 12. What is the great tribulation? First time it's mentioned. What is the resurrection of the dead? First time it's mentioned. Uh, is your name in the book? We'll talk about that next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for these folks. I love them dearly. Thank you for the opportunity to teach your word. Help us, Lord, to love you. Help us to walk with you, to be an encouragement, a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>